Good evening, everyone. I'm Janet Dolan, your host for this evening, and on behalf of both the Norway House and the Minnesota Peace Initiative, I'd like to welcome all of you here for what I know is going to be a very uh, engaging evening. First of all, I'd like to welcome back um, those of you who have been at previous programs, and I tried to get around and meet as many of you tonight as I can, and I see a lot of familiar faces, so that's great. But um, I've also, perhaps because of the topic, we know that we've uh, attracted um, a whole new audience, so I would also like to welcome all of you who are here for your first time. Uh, for those of you who are attending for your first time, let me tell you who we are and why we do these programs. Norway is a trusted global peacemaker. And because of that, a part of the Norway House, the Minnesota Peace Initiative, provides a forum for thoughtful discussion of current issues and conflicts where we can listen, and most importantly, where we can learn from each other. The goal of the Minnesota Peace Initiative is to delve deeply into challenging global issues. Like James Madison, we believe a well-informed electorate is essential for an effective democracy. We bring you, twice a year, experts who share their knowledge and insights so that we can become better informed about the important timely issues. Those of you who have joined us for past programs know that we've gotten a certain pattern to our program. I do the welcome and intro like I'm doing tonight. And then I usually hand it off to Tom Hansen, another member of our committee, who gives kind of a brief Cook's tour of the fundamentals of our topic before we then launch into our panel discussion. But because uh, Tom, a retired diplomat, is in some far-flung corner of the world tonight, I will be doing the opening Cook's tour on global warming. But before I do, so I want to remind you of a couple of things. Um, first of all, for those of you who are here for the first time, um, we will be passing um, cards and uh, out for you to write any questions you have. It gets to be a little frantic, but we try to leave 45 minutes for questions from the audience. And I will be shuffling through them and trying to get common themes and pulling out questions for our speakers based upon what you want to know. So if you have, we have uh, members of the Norway House team walking up and down the aisle and handing out cards. So if you want a card at all, raise your hand. Otherwise, they may just be passing them out. Uh, the second is what I mentioned before we started. Um, we are going to, we have 10 books on um, the climate change topic and I should have one here, but I don't. So will you bring one of the books up when you come? Uh, and I will show you the book. And then um, rather than drawing 10 names at the end of the program, which can get a little delayed when everybody wants to get to the parking lot and get home, um, we'll do it at a couple of milestones throughout the program so that we'll do maybe three and then three and then four at the end. So um, with that, um, and also I want to remind you as I hope I did at the beginning. We are very respectful of your time. And so we try to end exactly at 8.30. And so we will be working towards that so you know exactly how long the program will be. This is our 10th year of the Minnesota Peace Initiative programs. And for at least that long, and even a century before that, the world has known that the Earth's atmosphere is warming. In 1975, the term global warming was coined. So in very simple layman's terms, what is global warming? It is the warming of the atmosphere which causes the average annual temperature of the Earth to rise. This rise is caused when certain gases like water vapor, carbon dioxide, and methane are trapped in the atmosphere around the Earth. Then these trapped gases absorb infrared radiation that would otherwise go off into space, and this radiation causes the temperature of the Earth to rise. Now, we will learn much more about this process from our speakers tonight. We have provided you a timeline, and again, if you don't all have it, they are out at the front table. But to give you a background, because it is such a big subject, we've done a timeline of global warming and then we've also, on the bottom, done a timeline on the speed with which our population on the Earth has grown. This will be very handy, not only for tonight, but for you to take with you. So, 
These two timelines show us that we face dire consequences unless we change the course we are on. One of the consequences could be the extinction of mankind. Now that may sound like science fiction, and for all of our, us um, who love science fiction, um, but it isn't. We have had five previous incidents of global warming that would have caused human beings to become extinct had there been human beings on the Earth at that time. Four of these were caused by atmospheric warming due to natural causes on the Earth, and one of them was caused by a meteorite hitting the Yucatan Peninsula. In each case, nearly all life on the planet was extinguished. Then life began again, and in each case, it was followed by another case of extinction creating global warming. The last one was 66 million years ago. Whether we can change the arc of this relentless warming that we are on, and whether we can do it to prevent this global warming from getting that bad, will depend on all of us becoming more informed. It will depend on all of us expecting more of our political, our scientific, and our business leaders to help bring about what one scientist says we need, a global mobilization effort comparable to the World War II effort. So how did we get here? In the 18th century, the Industrial Revolution began and our dependence on fossil fuels began, as did the releasing of more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Also, since that time, the population of the Earth has grown from 1 billion to 7 billion. And industrialization has spread around the world. But lest we smugly blame our relatives and our ancestors for our situation, we need to acknowledge that half of the carbon in the atmosphere since the beginning of human history has been produced in the last 30 years. So it's our generation, the last generation, that has produced the dramatic rise in carbon in the air. So what are the consequences of our behavior? We see extreme weather patterns increasing around the world. I remember standing in our kitchen 15 years ago with our youngest son, Bob, who was reading about global warming. I made kind of a snarky, uh, offhanded comment that, gee, I sure felt bad for people in the rest of the world, but it was going to be great for Minnesota. No more winter. And um, as only a teenager can do, he cocked his eye and said, Mom, you know we're not talking about just nicer winters in Minnesota. We're talking about weather extremes. Whatever weather you have, hurricane, snowstorm, wildfire, hail or rain, it will become much more extreme. I never forgot that conversation. It is not about basking in swimsuits in Minnesota in January. It is about extreme weather and what it does to our planet. So what does it do to our planet? Here are just a few predictions. By the end of the century, we could have $600 trillion in climate damage, basically, double our current global economic GDP. Climate change could suppress economic growth. Global GDP could decline by 25 to 30 percent. We could see climate refugees numbering from 2 million to a billion, because some places will be hit worse than others. Those closest to the equator, particularly densely populated areas like India and Sub-Saharan Africa will face the worst damage, producing the greatest number of climate refugees. In closing, I'm reminded of an old high school sports cheer. Two, four, six, eight. Who do we appreciate? Well, when it comes to the Earth's temperature rising, we will not appreciate those numbers. Two is terrible. Four would be unthinkable. Six or eight could mean extinction. 
So on that cheery note, it is now my great pleasure to introduce our panelists for this evening. And they will help us sort through these issues, the opportunities, and most importantly, what is being done. Helping us to better understand these complicated and important topics, we have two panelists who are very knowledgeable and experienced in the area of global sustainability. Our first panelist is Dr. Lee Freilich. Dr. Freilich has his PhD in forestry and has done postgraduate work in forest soils and acid rain and paleoecology. Since 1997, he's been a member of the University of Minnesota graduate faculty in the areas of conservation biology and natural resources, science, and management. Since 2000, he has been the director of the University of Minnesota's Center of Forest Ecology. Dr. Freilich is a prolific writer and speaker on the topics of ecology and the environment. Uh, there is no threat that he will perish due to lack of publication. He has hundreds of them. Also, he's made nearly 500 media appearances on a wide range of national and local television and radio outlets. We appreciate very much Dr. Freilich joining us this evening, and I'm going to ask him to join me on the stage. Our second panelist is Dr. Gail Schuler. Dr. Schuler is Vice President of Sustainability and Product, Product Stewardship and Chief of Sustainability Officer at 3M. She has her undergraduate degree in physics and her doctorate degree in material sciences. She has over 25 years of technical and business leadership at 3M. She has led technical and business teams around the world, including Europe, Asia, Latin America, and North America. She travels the world representing 3M at conferences and programs on global warming and global sustainability. She indicates that she is passionate about making a positive impact on the world through science and technology. As we delve deeper into the future of climate change, we're going to need someone who has that passion and who can help us and the world deal with the challenges of global warming. We appreciate very much Dr. Schuler joining us this evening, and I'm going to invite you to join us on the stage. It's my pleasure now to turn uh, the podium over to Dr. Freilich. And uh, each of our panelists is going to give a brief opening just to kind of give you the foundation of their expertise and where they are and what they do on, in this area. And then I will uh, return to the podium and introduce Dr. Schuler to the podium. And then when I return, we will have a few questions between the three of us. And then as your questions come in, we will begin to ask questions from the audience. So I hope you enjoy the evening. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Freilich. Um, good evening. Um, thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to be here tonight to tell you all about uh, my specialty, which is forests. There are a few other things in here. Uh, I've chosen to talk about alternative futures that we could have if we choose a low emission scenario for carbon dioxide versus a high emission scenario. So the temperature of the world has risen about eight-tenths of a degree Celsius. Um, this shows the average, or average global temperature annually uh, since 1880 right up to 2018 here, and you can see the big rise that's occurred, especially steep in recent years. Uh, in Minnesota, it's risen even more than that, especially in winter, uh, because Northern latitudes and snowy places have a mar larger magnitude of change, especially if they're in the interior in the continent like Minnesota is. So this reverses a 5,000-year natural cooling trend. So some people think global warming could be a natural phenomenon. Well, not at all. The temperature has been going down in a natural trend for the last 5,000 years, and all of a sudden that has reversed. 
So I checked the, the latest CO2 concentration. It's now at 412 parts per million, and that is the highest in 3 million years. And if it continues up into five, six, seven hundred million, it'll be the highest it's been in more than 50 or 60 million years. And we could literally end up with the same chemistry in the atmosphere as at the time of the dinosaurs. So these are two alternative futures for the world from the British Meteorological Office. In the year 2095, the one on the right shows a reduced emission trend, and so the darker colors here, the oranges are, are warmer temperatures, and then the one on the left shows a business as usual trend with a much bigger magnitude of warming, probably four to five degrees Celsius for the world as a whole. And again, as you can see, we would warm more here being in the interior of a continent and a fairly northern latitude. So we have these greenhouse gas emission scenarios, low, medium, and high, as you can see here. So if we go on the low scenario and we reduce emissions by 80% by the year 2050, actually both CO2 concentration and temperature would start to fall just a little bit by the end of this century. It wouldn't go back to what it was uh, prior to the Industrial Revolution, but it would start to fall a little bit. Whereas if we go on the high or the business as usual scenario, it's gonna go up more and more steeply as time goes on. And, and in fact, I don't think it would stop at four to five degrees Celsius or, or eight degrees Fahrenheit. And I'll tell you why in a minute. So here's some alt alternatives. This is Boston in the year 2100 for the low scenario. And this is Boston in the year 2100 for the high scenario, right? People like to say that Miami is going to disappear, and that's true. But Boston as well, and New York City, and Washington, D.C., and Copenhagen, and Stockholm, and all sorts of other cities around the world are very much in danger if we go on the business-as-usual scenario. So why do scientists think global warming is so important? Um, sea level rise is bad enough, but the reason we really worry about it is because of its potential impact on biodiversity. And the species on the Earth, the species that created the, the Earth and the chemistry of the atmosphere that we evolved in and that we depend on for every, literally every breath of air that we take and every uh, mouthful of food that we eat, the ecosystem that produces all of that was created by all of these species that inhabit the Earth. So the largest mass extinction in the history of the Earth, the end Permian extinction uh, 250 million years ago, was caused by an episode of global warming. At that time, the rising CO2 was from a volcanic uh, episode and the resulting acidification of the ocean and loss of oxygen in the ocean resulted in a huge mass extinction in the oceans and then that um, went on to land because the oceans stopped producing oxygen and started producing toxic gases that poison species on land. So that's uh, why I think climate change is so important. We can still choose a low level of mass extinction, right? And, and we also have to, re this is the coral bleaching of the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, which has been about 50% bleached like this because of warming um, seawater in the last few years. We can still choose the low level of mass extinction rather than the high level. We have to remember that habitat degradation from other causes is also involved. Uh, a low CO2 emission scenario also minimizes chances of surprises or tipping points in the Earth's climate. Things like, how many of you have heard of these things? Arctic amplification, boreal or, or Amazon forest loss, equatorial super rotation or stratocumulus cloud breakup. I mean, we were recently surprised when somebody published an analysis showing that as carbon dioxide levels go up, stratocumulus clouds could disappear and that could almost immediately raise the temperature of the world 8 degrees Celsius or 15 degrees Fahrenheit. And we don't know exactly what condition would trigger that and if that happens that would be an extinction level event. And the, the more CO2 goes up the bigger the chance that will hit one of these tipping points. 
Um, and I question whether there is a scenario where we can go up four degrees Celsius warming and stop. I think we either go up two degrees or we go up four degrees and hit one of these tipping points and end up with eight or 10 or 12 degrees warming. Um, that's what the recent um, discoveries that scientists have made about the climate seem to say. So what about Minnesota? We're in one of the most interesting places on the planet. We have three biomes, boreal forest, temperate forest, which is your oak and maple, and then prairie. And there's only one other place like that in the world, and that's in Kazakhstan. So it's a very unique place where these three biomes come together, and that makes us very sensitive to a changing climate. Our natural resources could change hugely, and here are some of the biome maps that we made in my research lab at the university. So on the left there, you see the current biomes, and the boreal forest is dark blue. It comes into the very northeastern corner of Minnesota. Then there's mixed boreal and temperate in the green. And then the, the broadleaf forest. Again, that would be maple, oak, and basswood in the yellow, and the prairie out there on the left side to the west in the brown. For a low emission scenario, we could keep some boreal forest in the state, still have three biomes. The prairies would only advance a few miles. But for a business as usual scenario, the, pr the prairies could advance almost all the way to Grand Marais and all the way to Lake Michigan. We would lose the boreal biome and one third of all our species in Minnesota because our species of all groups, wildlife, insects, plants, birds are about evenly split between boreal and temperate and grassland. They each have about a third of all our species. In pictures, if you look at the boundary waters now, the blue star, where is a place that has a climate right now like the boundary waters would have near the end of the 21st century? Well, the orange star there near Granite Falls, Minnesota, the difference there is eight degrees Fahrenheit in mean summer temperature. And that turns this into this. The difference there is eight degrees Fahrenheit mean summer temperature. Same type of rock. Um, they're both igneous rocks. Same type of topography. Uh, that's what you get when you warm up the, the summer climate. No more conifers, some oaks, some prairie plants, and so on. So that's one of the the changes we face in Minnesota's loss of a biome. So these alternative futures are based on choices that we make today. And here you see um, a picture done by my friend David Luke. And we're going to give a lecture on this soon where he took iconic views of the Bounty Waters and digitally altered them to put oak trees and prairie above, but the boreal forest that's there right now is reflected in the water. So those are our two futures there, above the horizon and reflected in the water. So that's all I have to say for my opening statement. Thank you for listening. I told you they'd cheer you up. So. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Freilich. OK, Dr. Schumann, would you join us? Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, it's Minnesota, and thank you for your talk, Dr. Freilich. Um, Minnesota is home for 3M, and, um, and I've um, really appreciated the opportunity to be here with 3M and share with you some perspectives that we have as um, a longstanding 100 plus 117 year old citizen of the state of Minnesota. Um, we have in the la we've been committed to sustainability for a very long time since our earliest stages um, and identified back in 1975 actually a program an iconic program called pollution prevention pays it was revolutionary at the time when uh, dr lee came out with the idea but it's been something that since now i think most companies most people think makes a lot of sense um, so the idea is that by reducing waste or pollution that goes into water or air or physical materials, um, you can actually save money. And that's kind of that beginning of a sustainability journey, I would say, is that it's good for business. And we measure that every year still today. And um, 
And we continue to, we measure it for the first year savings alone, and we have delivered um, over 2.5 million short tons of waste have been eliminated in that program, and we've saved over $2 billion dollars um, just measuring the first year savings alone. So sustainability and corporate success, I think, can really fit hand to hand. And when you're a long-term company like 3M is, and you're continuing to focus on science and how you can advance not only um, your business, but what you can do for your customers and the communities where you live and work, um, you're constantly thinking about how do we uh, how do we ensure that we can continue to thrive and that the people and customers who count on us can also continue to thrive in the future? And so in doing so, um, we have a new CEO, Mike Roman, joined us um, in the CEO position. He's, a, he's an alumnus of the University of Minnesota, so I'm sure you all can be proud of him for that as well. But he, um, one of the things that was really important to him when he came on as CEO in July was that he wanted to make sure that we were really stepping up from a sustainability perspective and showing our leadership in that way. And he's certainly walked the talk on that. During his first meeting with um, investors, he brought forward and unveiled a program that um, we had been working on for a little while. He, he gave us some aggressive timeline on that. But it, it's our strategic sustainability framework. And with that framework, it drives along our ambition, which is about applying science to improve every life. And those of you around here, it's, it's fun to be here in Minnesota where you know that, yes, we're Post-it notes, and yes, we're scotch bright sponges, but we're also about energy efficiency in vehicles and uh, healthcare solutions and safety signs and roads and highways. And so you know the diversity and the breadth that we have. And so you see how we can really have that broad impact um, and touch people around the world. Um, what we recognized, and we did this through surveying all 93,000 employees, um, connections with a materiality study with our customers, with suppliers, with government leaders, NGOs, and various nonprofit thought leaders, um, investors, and probably a couple groups I'm not thinking of. Um, we got a lot of input on what, what was most material for us, how could we really make a difference, and what were the most important things that we as a global company could help impact in the world. And we identified that it was that science that we have that could really help make a difference. And we identified three focus areas where we could apply those to really have an impact. And they're about applying science for a circular economy. And so you can see here the aspiration around each of them is design solutions that do more with less material, advancing a global circular economy, the second is all about climate. I'm going to come back to that in a second. Um, the third is about science for community. And that's about creating a more positive world through science and inspiring people to join us. Um, whether it's healthcare solutions or helping people develop the scientific passion and acumen to really make a difference for the challenges that we face. But for tonight's purpose, I'm going to focus on science for climate. And that's where we innovate to decarbonize industry, accelerate global climate solutions, and improve our environmental footprint. These all overlap with each other to some extent or another, but they, they are um, an important rallying cry for us when we think about the impact that we can make. And so this was announced in November of last year. Maybe you saw some things about it. Mike Roman announced that. And then in the following month, um, we had the opportunity, um, our chief technology officer, uh, John Banovitz, my boss at the time, and I um, went to COP24. And so that was a fascinating meeting opportunity to meet um, leaders from uh, the public and private sector in civil society to, who are focused on the challenges associated with climate change. And we announced that beginning in 2019, that's this year, every new product that 3M has go into our new product commercialization process would have a sustainability value commitment. And that means that it has some way of helping to advance sustainability as part of its um, as part of its entity. So that could be that the new Scotch-Brite sponges are now made from recycled fibers. That's a good solution. It could be that um, the, the um, food safety products that we sell help reduce the energy required for petri film testing by 80% and the water by 60%. Um, and it could be things like um, our smog reducing roofing granules that are now really gaining traction in 
uh, California, particularly Los Angeles, for what they can do to help extract um, smog from the air. So really focused on things where we can make a difference through our products in collaboration with our customers. And then more recently and more directly aligned with climate on a day-to-day -day basis is that in February um, at a meeting of the St. Paul Chamber of Commerce, um, Mike Roman was able to come forward and talked about our renewed commitment around renewable energy. Uh, we ha we've set sustainability goals, public goals, since 1990. It was a pretty early company to do that, and we still keep setting them as we go forward. So our current set is um, set to mature in 2025. We established it in 2015. And already last year, we, we, well, we had one of the goals that was new for us in the 2015 maturing and 2025 goals was renewable energy. It was the first time we ever set a goal in that space. And we had the, what we thought was an ambitious goal of 25% of our global electric footprint would come from uh, renewable sources. I'm very pleased to tell you that last year in September, um, we passed the 25% mark. And so we knew that that meant we needed to set the bar higher. And that was part of what led um, Mike to introduce um, that we were renewing that commitment to renewable energy, that first of all, we were committing to, by 2025, we're gonna go up from 25% to 50% of our global electric footprint by, tw by 2025, and that our commitment was to move towards 100%, for sure by 2050, but maybe faster than that if we can. We'll always try to go faster. And then the next day on March 1st, we actually flipped the switch, if you will, to turn 100% of 3M Center, our campus over in Maplewood, to renewable energy in partnership with Excel. So we're really pushing more, working constantly to how we can advance because we know that um, we have an important role um, to play as a large global company. Um, we have visibility and we have um, customers and communities that we serve all around the world, and we're committed to doing that in the most responsible ways. So wanted to give you just a little bit of background on that, and uh, I'm looking forward to our discussion and Q&A. Thank you very much, Dr. Schuler. Before we begin, Larry, will you come up? Because it's very suspicious if I pick it up. So anyway, um, <laughs> the name of the book, and I plowed through this, so I should have known it, but is The Uninhabitable Earth, Life After Warming by David Wallace Wells. He's an editor for the New York Magazine, and he wrote a lengthy article, maybe two years, maybe 2017, I think, that just got a huge amount of uh, press. And so he expanded that into a book. So it's very, it, it, it's dense, a little dense, but nothing like the other reports I had to read. So um, <laughs> it's actually quite readable. And so if you are one of the winners, I think you're going to enjoy it. Okay, for we're going to begin with and the easiest process is to, we kind of alternate one question each, but again, if either of you wants to add a little on to the answer of the other, feel free. So, Dr. Freilich, I think um, we've adequately laid the foundation of just how bad things could get at different temperatures, and you covered that in your opening. So maybe it would help if we start out by actually talking about, is anything being done? I mean, are we just sitting ducks? Or are there some technologies? Just, you know, what can you give us to give some sense of, of what is actually being done or could be done on a larger scale if we had the will? Okay, um, well, geez, that could take a couple hours. Um, <laughs> I hope but, so, I hope there's that many things. Well, yeah, I mean, we just heard what's being done. Uh, and a lot more companies could do things like 3M is doing. But in terms of large-scale mitigation of climate change, there's this invention that takes carbon out of the air and sequesters it, and it can do it on a massive scale, and it's very friendly to people. Anybody can use it. And it was invented 300 million years ago, and it's called a tree. Uh, <laughs> Um, and by my calculation, if we planted an area of trees on lands that were formerly forested, about equal to the 48 states, we could sequester all the carbon that would be emitted for the next several decades in those trees. And you might say, well, that's impossible. That's such a huge area. It's only 6% of the land surface of the earth. 
and there's seven billion people out there, each of which who could plant some trees. So that's definitely one thing that could be done at scale. Uh, we, I and a former student and some others at the university have started an organization called Green Again Madagascar to reforest Madagascar and you, you donate a dollar here and it's like a hundred dollars in Madagascar. So our student has a nursery there and is planting forests and we want to scale that up and a lot of efforts like that could be done in various places around the world. Um, and, um, okay, how about science and technology? Any, any, for instance, the New York Times reported last, I think less than a week ago, about a large plant down in, in, in um, Alabama that takes carbon out of the air. Is that realistic? Are we just uh, hanging our hat on um, science that is at such a small scale it won't make a difference? Or Personally, I think it would be um, much easier for people to reduce emissions than to try to build an artificial device that would take carbon out of the air. Because you have to get energy to run that. You have mm -hmm. to do something with the carbon. Mm -hmm. Why not store it as trees all over the landscape? I mm -hmm. mean, people actually like trees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I like trees a lot, too. Um, I think there's some things that can be done from a mitigation perspective as well. I mean, we make choices every day uh, about simple things. Um, I remember when I came into the sustainability world for the first time, I had some, an example that I will never forget, so I'll choose to share it with you. And the question was, which has a higher carbon footprint? Would it be... Would it be a vegetarian driving a Hummer, a Humvee, or an omnivore driving a Prius? It's orders of magnitude difference. Over the course of your lifetime, you make a much lower carbon footprint if you're a vegetarian, even if you drive a Humvee. Now, having said that, I would suggest that there's some really fantastic technology that's happening with electric vehicles as well, and that they can be sourced, you know, they can be powered with renewable energy, and things have really moved forward. I personally drive one. I do have solar on my roof, in case you were asking, um, it, but it really makes a difference in terms of the things that you can do, and, and some of these things, um, a vegetarian diet or a, even just shifting a little bit in that direction you know, can help make some of those differences in ways that aren't um, perhaps as severe, as austere, as, as some other things you might think about. Well, one, of the, tree. Yeah, uh, one of the um, points that uh, Mr. Uh, Wells makes in his book is um, one of the reasons we are uh, paralyzed or um, scared uh, into not making changes is we make the changes that would need to be made too scary. Mm -hmm. For instance, suggesting that people give up meat is not a, you know, it's not a viable alternative. Mm -hmm. But changing the feed that you give animals that reduces the methane, maybe, and could be. So, so his point is, there is a lot that science can do, but we, when we, uh, when we frame it, the problem and the solution as, life as you know it has got to go away, and the life you're going to have to go to to create this sustainable is not going to be very appealing. We end up with paralysis. So it's, it's you know, and I'm going to ask you in a minute about your global conferences. The question is, have we got people coming together and saying, look, how can we find a middle road, which is everything you give up doesn't have to be um, seen as, you know, we're stepping back in modernity, for instance, electric cars, driverless cars, Teslas, they're all coming and um, people are paying a lot of money and enjoying them very much. So it's not as though doing away with a fossil fuel engine is gonna be the end of civilization as we know it. And the same can be true with eating meat, a lot of other things, mm -hmm. but only if we start to shape it and frame solutions. So yeah. you go to global conferences, will you kind of give us a little cook's tour of the world? We're, we keep kind of inwardly looking at Minnesota and the United States, but What's the rest of the world doing? How do we compare to them? Who's moving forward? Who's going to really do something? Who isn't? Um, so thanks for the opportunity. Um, you know, I have had some wonderful opportunities. In fact, um, specifically recently, I've 
been out at uh, the United Nations Environmental Assembly. Um, the UN Global Assembly is based in New York City, as you all know, but the UN Environment Assembly is based in Nairobi, Kenya. And um, it was fascinating for me to attend this event. I've never been in an event before that was so large, it was about 4,000 people, with um, such a representative group of the global population. So it was, uh, everything was simultaneously simulcast in English and Chinese, and about a third of the people there were from China listening to the Chinese simulcast. Um, lots of people from India, every African country was represented. Um, a little bit from Europe, a little bit from North America, a little bit from South America. I met one person from Australia, you know, but it was really kind of fascinating in that regard. And it's, it's heartening to me that the, you find government leaders, corporate leaders, um, private civic leaders, NGOs, private, private citizens, um, attending and coming with new creative ways to help solve challenges. Um, the biggest one that China was really talking about was engaging on renewable energy, um, setting up uh, a grid that would cross all of Asia, Russia, and Africa, Russia, Europe, and Africa. Um, that's a big move. Um, the thing that was also um, an aha, because I mean, we often think of Europe as leading in sustainability, and it is in many ways, but Africa is actually taking some really important strides um, for very practical reasons. So many of you may be aware that in Africa, instead of going to um, wired telephones, they've jumped right to cell phones. And you know, they're right on the internet and the, the penetration is remarkably high of what people can access. They're doing their banking through their phones and all kinds of things like that. But you might not be aware that in um, countries like Kenya and Malawi and Uganda and Rwanda, they've banned single-use plastics. Yeah. <laughs> now, I will tell you there are some exemptions underway, but if you go around the city of Nairobi, you really do, you have to look to find like a plastic bag or a plastic piece. You can be charged $400 if you bring some into the country, so I don't recommend doing that. Um, and I had the opportunity to meet the gentleman and, the, and their Congress who brought forward this law. And it was just fascinating to hear. It was 18 months ago they put it in place. And like I said, you don't really see plastic waste all, along the streets. And he explained that it was for very practical reasons. They didn't have good um, waste collection. And they certainly didn't have good re recycling schemes. But now they're pushing. What you saw then are the, there's plastic companies coming forward and there's innovative ways they're finding solutions to problems that um, here we're not really acting on. And it was just, I think, three weeks ago, the European Union put forward their first ban on single-use plastics after being led from Africa. So I really get excited about some of these creative ways that people are going forward. And um, I, I asked people about how they adjusted to that, to your point about adjustments and people don't like to change sometimes. They said that, you know, they have all those little street carts that were sell, serving samosas or the, for breakfast in the morning. And they said overnight, one day, it went from being in plastic packages to paper. And it really wasn't that big a deal. You know, there are things that you take for granted. So I'm going to come back to your comment on the sacrifice on meat, because we have been doing a little experiment at 3M on this. It really is a big deal from an environmental footprint perspective. And I know personally, we've been experimenting. I still eat meat, but I just don't eat nearly as much. <laughs> and um, and um, one of the things that we did actually last fall, we put in a meatless Mondays program at 3M. It didn't really go over that well. For, for April, this, this, but we didn't give up. This April, we've put in a mindful, mindful Mondays. And we've been giving more information about the, the choices that you make with food and whether it's being grown locally or if it's um, the, the footprint of the food that you eat. And um, it's actually receiving a really positive response. So part of it is in helping people be aware and maybe the recipes are better. I don't know, but it's a, a concept of what are you doing and what choices are you making. And um, my husband makes the best um, burritos, meatless burritos that I love. I could have them all the time. So I don't know. Well, I come from a farm, uh, cattle ranch, so I can oh. tell you. 
I, I don't eat much meat either, but I do know that, like with many things in our society, especially in the American, if your answer to something is you just got to take it all away and live without it, you will not get the political will to do it. If you find ways to saying, we can find a better way to do what we're doing, then I think it's a more, much more engaging and palatable um, sure. a solution. And we have, and my next question for both of you is, we, without getting political on one side or the other, we do not, at least currently in our country, uh, at least on a national level, have any political will to do anything substantial on this. But we do have local, I mean, I think they're plastic bag free in parts of California too. Mm -hmm. So, um, but so can local and state governments do anything or do much? Or is it we all share one big uh, climate and you can do a little over here, but it doesn't help you if you know China or India or, or somewhere else is not helping. So is there something that we can do on our own local level between our local government and our state government? Or is it simply going to have to be a national and international effort to really move the dot, whether it's planting you know, trees or whatever it is? Well, I think that it actually works better if it comes from many different local sources. Now, if it's a grassroots type of organization to do it, and that's what's happening in the United States, you know, where we haven't had any national leadership. And um, once a few states do it and, and see the advantages of it, other states do it, and the same with cities and the same with individuals. So it's the same as any other trend in, in society. Once you get a a certain mass going, other people and other governmental units follow. Because okay. I know one of the things we're going to ask before we leave is what can all of us do? So you would, you would say getting things starting at the grassroots is probably a more viable long-term um, right. effort than... Yeah, the, and, and speaking of grassroots, grass-based agriculture for cattle is you can actually sequester a lot of carbon in the soil in those agro-ecosystems mm -hmm. as opposed to chopping down millions of acres of rainforest and grazing cattle there. If you graze cattle in areas that are naturally through their climate supposed to be grasslands, you're sequestering lots of carbon in the soil in the because soil. Of, of the roots of the grass. Okay. Um, I, one of the things that I like to think about when I think about um, the future and what, what to expect and how to innovate is um, this concept of the future is here already. It's just not evenly distributed. So that very much gets to your point mm -hmm. of this idea that things you do locally over time, when, as you figure out how they work well, they tend to naturally propagate and they, and they can advance. I mean, so the example that I gave with Nairobi, um, you know, they were doing it because it was a really practical need that they had. Um, I remember se several years ago, um, I used to live in Austin, Texas, and Whole Foods was the first store that I knew of that wouldn't give you paper bags, and they just stopped. And so you had to figure it out. And then the whole city went forward with no plastic bags. And then you saw cities in California and things, and things propagate that way. I think an example that is going quite well in Minnesota is this um, renewable electricity. I think that, you know, Excel has made some really nice, ambitious goals. 3M announced ours. Um, a, a week or two later, the state announced theirs, um, and there have been others who stepped forward. And, you know, you build momentum on this, and I think things become more familiar. Um, uh, you know, I mentioned the electric car thing. You know, um, when I got mine, it was five and a half years ago. It was kind of a brave new move, it seemed at the time. At least that's what other people saw. I actually thought it was going to be great. Everything I knew about it was great. And now, you know, more and more people are adopting that. And um, a little token of knowledge, do you know where the highest density of tens Teslas are per capita on the planet? Norway. <laughs> so there you go. And that's done with, you know, started with local legislation and, and national legislation in Norway. Um, you know, it's, you do it piece by piece. Okay. Um, Dr. Freilich, can you, I, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but um, I think one of the things that when you read about um, sort of the last 30 years of global, our effect on global warming is uh, getting um, people, the population, to recognize that this is coming faster than we think. 
that if, if, if somehow we have been lulled into thinking, and it shouldn't make any difference if it's a problem for our great-grandchildren as opposed to our children, but if you think you know, this is you know, going to be a 21st century, 22nd, 23rd century issue, can you just give us, I, you, you certainly had an uh, uh, impressive slide there <laughs> with the red line going up, but what can we say to people that says, look, here's 10 and 20, 30 years out, and, and it may, it, it, it's coming fast. So what can you tell us about the timeline in terms of how the speed with which it may be coming? Well, for a business as usual scenario for carbon dioxide emissions, um, within 50 years, I would think we would see the loss of the boreal forest in Minnesota and prairies taking over most of the state. So we'd have extreme droughts. You know, the state would become arid. And as I said in my talk, once you get to that level, natural feedbacks within the earth will accelerate it even more. And that's why scientists want to stay under two degrees Celsius of warming, because that really reduces the chance that the feedbacks in the earth will accelerate the warming, you know, because a lot of people used to believe in this thing called Gaia, that the earth regulates and balances itself and keeps temperatures in a certain range. Well, there's a new hypothesis that a lot of good scientists buy into now called the Medea hypothesis that once the Earth starts to go a little bit off the mean, it accelerates and goes way off. It's, in, in effect, it's the exact opposite of Gaia. And the paleoecological history of the Earth we've been able to reconstruct shows that that is the correct model to look at. You have to keep changes small, otherwise the Earth itself will magnify them. Just one follow-up. Um, it's hard enough to make the transla translation from Celsius to Fahrenheit for some of us, but um, as you read through a number of different articles, it's hard to keep absolutely precise. Where are we on that going up one degree, going up two degrees, going up three degrees? Have we crossed the two degree increase, Celsius degree increase, are we close to it? Anyway, just, no, just put a framework of w how far up we are. We're not close to it right okay. now. We're at about eight tenths of a degree Celsius. Okay. okay. So, but we expect that rate of rise to accelerate. So 40 years from now, it'll be too late to reverse course. And we will have crossed that line. Yep. Okay. Maybe even 20 years from now, we will have crossed the line, you know, and a lot of times you hear this 12-year thing. Mm -hmm. That could be too. And in fact, scientists don't know exactly when we cross that line and the, the opposite effect starts where the Earth starts to magnify it. We don't know exactly when that will be triggered, which is why we should be conservative and limit CO2 emissions now. Mm -hmm. And as we've heard, the economy can be great and quality of life can be really good and companies can do well with, with reduced emissions. Okay. If you want to bring the questions up now, you should, because I want to make sure that I've got enough time. So, okay, um, I'm going to ask each of you quickly, and we can circle back again um, at, at the end. As each concerned citizen here walks out, what can they do? What, what can they do in their personal life? What can they do? in their investor life? What can they do in their government uh, engagement life to, to help slow down this global warming? Sure, I'll think. So the vegetarian thing is actually legit. Um, you know, you don't have to go all the way there, but just be more conscious. I think of beef like I think of chocolate now. It's a real treat and I'll have it when it's really good, but you know, the, the cheap stuff I don't go for anymore. And the Impossible Burger is not bad. Um, it's a vehicle for carrying great condiments is kind of my view. Anyway, um, so that, that makes a difference. You, you, I mean, you make a difference every day as consumers in your choices, whether it's you know, what types of companies and organizations you invest in or what products you purchase, it does make a difference. You know, it makes a difference in which companies can succeed in the world. I do think that your choices on transportation, you know, I mean, it'd be fantastic if we walked and biked, and sometimes that's not practical, but think about emissions and, um, you know, sharing a ride with a friend or things like that. Just, you know, a little bit more conscious. I think those things are really valuable. Um, also think about waste. I do think that, you know, um, uh, you know, can we, you know, 
can you do without something? You know, that plastic wrapper for the samosa, did you really need that? You know, are there things you can do without? Are there things you can reuse? Can you recycle? All of those things really do make a difference when we do it together. And then um, as you're learning about things and thinking about things, share them with friends and family and colleagues, you know, and, and share best practices and ideas. Uh, that's how we continue to advance and find the best solutions to any challenge. Well, I also like to use myself in a, as an example, so I also only eat meat occasionally now instead of all the time. I've made that change. I live in an 800-square-foot condo in downtown Minneapolis. I do all my errands on foot. I came over here on the light rail, um, and I got that idea from my friends in Europe. I have friends in Poland and Estonia and Denmark, and they emit about half the CO2 per person that we do. And as far as I could see, they were just as happy or, or, as, or happier than we are um, with that lifestyle. And so I decided to try it. And you know what? When, I, when I'm on my way home during the summer, going down the Loring Greenway, I have to allow an extra half an hour because I keep running into friends and have to stop and talk to each one. Um, in the winter, it's only five minutes because each... <laughs> Each conversation is only 30 seconds, but those types of neighborhoods that are walkable are, are incredibly friendly places to live, even in the middle of a big city. Dr. Schumer, uh, there's a number of questions here about business, okay. and so I'll try to tie them together, but I think one of the most uh, cohesive ways is um, this has become for whatever reason, a politically partisan issue. Mm -hmm. So what can business do to um, translate it into an economic issue? Can, are, are businesses forming coalitions and lobbying and you know, becoming more of a, a voice of, you know, it's not partisan, it's, you know, we're, it's an economic issue. And yeah. anyway, so what, what's going on, or even globally, but what, what can business do to be more of a voice to get um, yeah. bring people together? I mean, I, I actually really believe that um, it, business, governments, um, civic society all have important roles and they have important strengths that they can bring to bear and they have to collaborate together to really address these challenges. So, um, you know, a lot, I think that there's a lot of things about um, any megatrend or challenge that really create business opportunities. I mean, certainly the renewable energy space that's going forward, I think that things related to new materials, solutions, plant-based materials, other things like that, really um, help create an impact. And, you know, regardless of which side of the aisle you might be on, no one thinks pollution is a great idea. You know, so there's a pretty good um, approach on that. I think also that, you know, even, I think that both sides of the aisle can see business opportunities associated with renewable energy or, or reinventing manufacturing chains. One of the things that um, I think is really exciting that's just getting started right now is that pillar that I talked about earlier with the, the, the circular economy. The whole idea is that if you think of it, I'll explain it because before we really got onto this at 3M, some super smart corporate scientists that I presented to as we were first unveiling this, they all looked at me and they said, circular, really? So I'll, I'll, you may all know, but they didn't, so I'll explain it to you. The idea is that typically we think of a life cycle of a product as you take some raw materials, you do a process, manufacturing, combine things in different ways, it goes through its useful life, and at the end it goes into a waste stream, maybe a landfill. But the whole idea of a circular economy is that if something reaches its end of life, it then becomes a raw material for something else. So I like to use aluminum, um, aluminum cans as a good example because um, for most of us, when we were growing up, we would see aluminum cans along the side of the street or things like that. We don't see that anymore, virtually anywhere in the world, because there's value to that aluminum and there's a robust chain to build it back into either another can or a car or something else. Um, so that is an example of a circular economy that really works. What we need to do now is we, um, we do have a lot of plastic waste in places that we shouldn't have it. It's in the ocean, it's in landfills. Um, there are some really great partnerships that are getting started um, where 
um, we can take that plastic waste and then use that as a raw material to go into things. I like the example of um, colleagues of mine working at uh, fundamental plastics companies. They, a number of different companies have said it in different ways, so I won't cite it a specific example. But um, if we knew, if we started now with the raw materials that we had today and tried to make the highest, purest um, uh, plastics, would we really be digging down into the ground a mile deep and pulling out black oil with dirt and soil? We probably wouldn't. We would find that we have plastics buried under the ground, plastics floating in the oceans, plastics along seashores, that we can transform into new plastics going forward. Now, it's not the manufacturing infrastructure we have in place today. It's a whole new space that we have to bring forward. But I believe that is like a really important piece. And there's opportunities for business success in that as well. So I think that's an important way that companies can work together. We have a question here, um, which I'm very curious about too. The Great Lakes, what is the worst case scenario with regard to global warming and how would it impact the Great Lakes? Do, have you looked at that or do you have an opinion? Yeah, boy, is that a hard question to answer. Well, some scientists say the, that the level will fall dramatically and some say that it will go up. Um, but the water will warm for sure that will change the species of fish, that will cause phosphorus that's been sequestered in the sediments in the bottom of the lakes for thousands of years to come into solution because whether it stays in the sediment or goes in the water is in part dependent on temperature, so there could be a lot of negative effects. Uh, it, there's one thing to think about. Um, during the mid-Holocene, which was 7,800 years ago, in the middle of Lake Huron, there was a civilization, which is now at the bottom of the lake. So summer temperatures then were about four degrees warmer than they are now, and there was so much evaporation that Lake Huron was three separate lakes. And the water level in Lake Michigan and Huron was 200 feet lower. So that's kind of an ominous sign, you know, that once we get to the point where summers start to warm, the initial phases of global warming it was all in the winter and the summer hardly warmed at all, but once the summer's warm and you get that powerful rate of evaporation going and the great drying of our forests and the evaporation coming out of the Great Lakes summer and winter because there won't be any ice cover, uh, I am starting to favor the idea that we'll get a major drop in water level. That, that'll be the ultimate. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Shuler, we got a lot of questions about China. <laughs> so, um, you've, you've talked about different parts of the world, but can you just briefly say, is, is China going to be the world leader on getting us out of this? Is, I mean, what, what, what is the role of, and how big a role is China going to have vis-a-vis -vis us or Europe or other parts of the world? Oh, I, okay, so first of all, I don't know, but I'll be happy to share with you some perspectives and thoughts. Um, I took my first trip to China um, about 20 years ago. And um, I went to Shanghai, which was a big city, not nearly as big as it is now. And then I went to um, the Shenzhen, Guangzhou area, which is uh, close to um, what was then an independent Hong Kong. And um, in the Shenzhen area at that time, um, this, there were dirt streets. Um, one hotel that Westerners stayed in, and um, a lot of manufacturing plants popping up everywhere. Um, I saw, you know, people on bicycles, families of five on bicycles, chickens and boxes and all kinds of craziness. Um, and you know the manufacturing was starting really at that time. Um, over the next, over the several few years after that, you know I would go back fairly regularly. And now Shenzhen um, has, over the next decade, I would say the Shenzhen grew to, um, a, I don't know the population. I'm, I'm guessing it's 10 million people. Huge, you know skyscrapers, malls, um, and just incredibly um, poor air quality with all the manufacturing. Um, then there was a major, I don't remember what sporting event it was, it was a major sporting event and they decided that for the world stage they would move all of their manufacturing uh, farther west. 
And um, I knew this was going on, and I went back to visit Shenzhen, visiting customers and so on. And um, I opened my blinds in my hotel. I arrived at night and opened the blinds in the hotel room. Now there's many, many hotels at this point. And um, it had rained the night before, and for the first time ever, I saw that there were these mountains and palm trees and things. You know, when they move the... So the point being that when um, China chooses to move because of how their government works, I, I mean, I'm not a fan of their government style, but I will tell you it's nothing if not efficient. It's fast. And they really, and I was also struck by how fast the environment actually seemed to be recovering at that time from really severe pollution. Um, right now, China has, you know, a higher greenhouse gas footprint than any other country in the world, including the United States. Um, they are also, you know, buying more electric vehicles. They are also installing more renewable electricity. They are moving, and um, for their own self-interest, um, they're, they're really going aggressively after this. Um, so we count on them to make a big difference for all of us on the planet. They have their own vested interest to be working on that. Um, but. But we have, but I think that we have to pay attention to what they're doing too. Um, they're they're moving, and I think what I'm glad that they are, and um, I hope that answers your question. China is important. Uh, they seem to be coming to the top of the list in almost any category. Yeah, I mean, so okay. um, also I would just uh, say that uh, for those of you that are here for the first time. Uh, we, uh, on the, I said we're 10 years old, and well, as I was getting ready for tonight, I was really surprised how many of the topics we have covered before are all tied into this. I mean, we, we had one, one on uh, the One Belt, One Road uh, policy of China, which is building that, uh, that infra infrastructure uh, through, through much of the world. We had one on refugees, and that is just refugees from war. Global refugees from climate are going to make this look small, you know. We had one on plastics and plastic bags and everything. So anyway, it is, these topics all, you realize, all tie together and, and, are, and influence each other. Um, we have a, a number of interesting questions all around uh, wind turbines, nuclear power. Um, should we be looking at these? And, and, and one of our uh, uh, members here says, uh, wind, wind turbines are interesting, but we buy all the parts from China. Do we really want to do that? So it's, it's, it's kind of interesting, the, the, the crosswinds. But um, what, what do you guys think about? Because alternative energy seems to be one of the areas we could make the most progress in. We won't even begin to say how are we going to fly in airplanes, but but um, but alternative energy. So wind turbines viable? Should they be a high priority? Nuclear plants viable? High priority? Sure. Um, yeah, I think that solar is is probably overall the most viable and the most available source of energy. And as technologies for storing the energy that you make during the day to use at night or on cloudy days gets better, which it has been very rapidly in recent years. I think that's going to become the dominant, or I hope it's going to become the dominant form of energy. Wind is good. Nuclear tends to be rather expensive, as is its problem. And the new designs for nuclear reactors are not like the old ones. They can't melt down the way the old ones did but they're still very expensive to build and still causes quite a commotion in the local population when you try to build them. So solar is probably the, the best way to go because we know there's plenty of solar energy many, many times what we actually need. Um, I'm, I'm also a fan of solar in many ways. Um, any of the various types of energy have trade-offs. Um, one of the catches that we find with solar when we think of, I mean, it, it actually works really well at my house um, and, you know, retail establishments, uh, my colleagues, peers who work at companies that are retail focused tend to find it works really well there. When you're doing high energy intensive work like we have in our manufacturing facilities, it takes a tremendous amount of area to put in solar. So I think that's kind of the balance that you look off. And one of the things that happens with wind is um, that it, you know, it is able to generate a lot more energy in a smaller space. Um, inherently, some geographies are better for wind, some are better for solar. I like that solar is more of that passive piece rather than the, the you know, 
wind takes more repair than solar typically. Um, nuclear, kind of tricky. You know, I, I'm not, uh, I think that, you know, nuclear typically has a waste profile that is problematic. And so I am more, much more of a fan of renewables um, over those. And storage is, as you mentioned, storage is absolutely key. Great strides, I think, are, making, are being made in that space, but there's still a lot more work to be done before we can really go completely off of a grid and, and go to storage. Um, it is a tricky piece that we do rely on a lot of manufacturing and a lot of things do come from China and how do we handle that as, I mean, you know, the, the, the peace society, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's something that we need to keep in mind is how do we um, advance and thrive as a cooperative um, global economy. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Frelick, you're... Um your desire that uh, planting trees solve the problem has gotten some uh, a significant group of followers here. So uh, I've got a number of questions of um, what kind of tree should I plant? Does my planting make a difference? Can we plant them in Minnesota? Is it really somewhere else we need to plant them? I mean, so you had about two minutes. Can you give them the tutorial on uh, go to Bachman's and buy what? Sure. Okay. I, my email box is perennially filled with questions from people about what species of trees they That's should right. plant. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of species that are becoming available in the in this area because the winters are warmer. So we've that's one advantage of global warming. We now have London plane trees in Minneapolis. And I was worried that they might, be, might have been killed this winter, and I was just looking at a few of them, and the buds are still alive, and they're going to open. So, so even London Plain, which is a type of sycamore, you can grow here now, and the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board is planting 60 species of trees in Minneapolis, you know, because we have also imported 400 and... 71 diseases and insect pests, mostly from China. These are not the types of imports we want to bring in. 471 species of diseases and insect pests of trees have been imported to North America. And that's why we have to plant lots of species. It's not just climate change that's a problem. But basically, you can find species of trees that will work in all parts of the world. Somebody asked me if there was one species you could use everywhere, and the answer is definitely not. Um, so in this area, the disease-resistant elms are good. There are 25 Dutch elm disease-resistant varieties available now in nurseries. So those are good. Basswood is going to be good. Um, Bur oak and white oak and red oak are going to be good for a long time in the Twin Cities here. And uh, there's, there's no reason not to plant trees. What's become a problem in recent years are some of the conifers, like Austrian pine and blue spruce and black hill spruce, which are very common. And the reason is we get these very long periods of high humidity in the summer. Last summer we had like 25 inches of rain. It just rained every day for a month. And we had the record rainfall. Well, a lot of those conifers got needle, fungal needle diseases. And so I'm not as optimistic about them as I am about things like oaks and, and London plane trees and basswood and elms for this part of the world. And just in case you didn't write all of those down, <laughs> I, I should have mentioned this. Each of our programs is recorded, and you can get the recording on, I believe, on the website uh, for the Norway House, yes. And, uh, and then frequently, Minnesota Public Radio will play it at noon hour. And so there are different ways. So if you want to uh, get your notebook out and, and get a, another chance at that list, you can, you can do that. Well, this will be our last question, and it's a, it, um, it's, it's a two-part question, uh, because p half of it is mine. Um, you are a sustainability um, executive, and you mentioned um, things you do. You've got to drive a Prius and solar energy and try to eat less meat or make it a smaller part of your diet. One of the questions is, what can we do in our home? What, what are five things any one of us can do in our home? And then the other half of the question, which is mine, which is, you go to all these conferences. Is there anything on the horizon about airplanes? Because from Al Gore to any of the rest of us, we fly a lot. And the, what that does, I mean, I've heard statistics, it's like 
eight months of driving your car just in one trip. I mean, it's, yeah, I know, it's just an astronomical number. So for those of us that do fly a lot and yet feel guilty about it, is there anything on the horizon? So what can you do in your house and what are you going to do about the air? What can we do about airplanes? Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. So, I mean, house, I, I mentioned solar on the roof. That can help. Um, planting your trees, that can help. Um, and then I think, you know, being mindful in various types of energy efficient ways, um, you know, probably generally good ideas. Um, water usage, um, recycling again. So some of those are, are examples that we talked about. Um, on the um, aircraft front, there's a couple of different things that are happening, and it is something that we need to get resolved, but I think um, we're closer on renewable electricity than we are on, on uh, jet fuels. But there are a number of things happening from that perspective. So first of all, things that you can do today, if you're passionate about it and want to address the guilt associated with it, you can purchase the carbon offsets. Every major airline will be delighted to have you um, pay and they'll help um, advance carbon offsets for your travel. Um, then another thing that is going on, I guess, a couple things that are happening. One is um, there are a number of efforts underway right now with uh, alternative fuels. I haven't seen the first, I, most of the airlines are working on things like um, algae-based fuels and others that are really innovative fuels. I, I haven't seen anyone ready to convert a major airline, major air flight to that at this stage, but it's definitely something in the research space. Um, the other thing that's happening that is a little mind boggling, but I'm personally convinced it's going to happen, um, if not in our lives, in our children's lives, is um, uh, drone services to places. And that can be very often done with electricity and batteries. But, you know, a single use drone, maybe you're going up to the boundary waters and you may be flying, you know, your own individual drone up there um, rather than what we think about. It's here, it's just not evenly distributed. <laughs> okay, well, thank Can you. Can I add a, yes. a word to oh, that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, in, in 2013, I brought the Ecological Society of America here for their annual meeting, so 3,300 scientists, and I was one of the organizers at the Minneapolis Convention Center, and we charged an extra $5 in the registration fee for each registrant. And we used that to plant five acres of trees on a really good abandoned farmland site with really good soil. And those trees will soak up all of the CO2 emitted by those people flying from all over the world to Minneapolis. <laughs> it will take them, the trees, 40 years to do that, but it, they will soak up an equivalent amount of CO2. So that was my solution when I was in charge of having 3,000 people fly to Minneapolis. Well, also, I don't, I don't know whether these exist, but I can't imagine that they won't soon. I mean, there is a lot written about um, the nonprofit world and, um, um, you know, crowd um, fundraising. And so I can't imagine that there may not be large foundations that you could simply give money to and they will plant trees around the world, you know, on a scale. So anyway, anyway, so, and, and they may already exist, I don't know, but it seems to me that that may may be coming. So, well, um, I'm going to announce uh, three more winners of the books, and then we'll have just a few closing comments, and then we will announce the last four, since I know you're all on the edge of your seat chair. J.R. Christensen. Again, you don't have to raise your hand or anything, but just go to the desk uh, before you leave, and you'll get a book. I think it's Jean Peters. P-E-T-E-R-S, and one more. Kelly uh, Findall, F Findlar, if I, uh, in, uh, um, from Afton. Kelly Findlar, okay, great, very good. So first of all, um, I want to thank our um, speakers uh, this evening. So why don't we give them a big round of applause.
For those of you who have been here before, you know that we give each of our speakers a very special gift to remember this evening from. And um, it is a um, Minnesota uh, sacred pipe, and it is made from Minnesota native pipe stone. And if I can quickly. And it looks like this, and we have them handmade. And frequently, our guests are from out of town, and I volunteer that they don't have to give it up to TSA, we'll mail it to them. But since you're both here, except if you're on a bicycle, maybe you're not gonna do this. Well, <laughs> so, and it's just, just a small token of our appreciation. So we really appreciate it. We hope you enjoy it and always look at it and think about this evening. So thank you very much. Also, I would like to thank, and you've already met uh, Larry, but I'm gonna make him stand up again. Uh, Larry Bakken is the chairman of our um, event committee, and we have a number of uh, committee members here, and I think their names are on the program. And uh, so I just wanna have us give a big round to everybody who plans this event. And I make this pitch at each event that if you would like to join us, we'd love to have you. And we get a new member every year. So uh, advertising is worthwhile. So thank you very much. Um, I would also like to thank uh, the Norway House uh, board members that are here. Would you stand since you support our program? Would, you, would the members of the Norway board stand? Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank uh, Christina Carlton, who I think is in the back of the room, who's the executive director of the Norway House, and also Robin Cole, who's on the team there, and she really does all the work for us, so we appreciate it. And as much as we uh, appreciate the, the great facilities that we have here at, at McNamara, our long-term goal is to hold these programs in the gathering room at the new Norway House. And we are the, in the um, process of raising money, uh, capital campaign, and so I encourage all of you uh, who have any interest in this and, uh, and, and bring in all your family and friends too and contribute to the capital campaign. And also they have great programs that we do have in Norway House right now. Um, it's over on Franklin and 11th and I, I always give the plug, unlike anywhere else in the city, it has great parking, free great parking. And, uh, but they have great programs and so check the website. Right now they are having uh, an exhibit in the gallery called Sami Dreams and I was not aware of this, but Sami people, um, are Northern Europe's only indigenous people. And so of course they are across the top of Norway and Sweden and Finland and Russia around the Arctic. Uh, and so it's a, um, it's a display and oral uh, interviews with them. So it's, it'd be a fascinating thing. So I just encourage you to check the website for all of the activities going on. And finally, I would just like to thank you. All of you who have come this evening um, great questions, uh, great attendance. Um, we do these programs for you, and so we're just very happy that you were here tonight, and I hope you found it uh, stimulating, not too depressing, but uh, depressing enough to make you want to do something. There's a fine line we, we wanted to hit. So anyway, so thank you all for coming. And um, with that, I'm going to read the last four names. Um, and I was going to make a joke about global warming, except nobody ever jokes about global warming, but um, usually at the spring meeting, it's, it's like gorgeous, you know, it's like the first spectacular day. And so then I always say, I'm really sorry you had to come out on a beautiful spring night. And then tonight I thought, oh, <laughs> global warming is here. <laughs> so it's, it's turned it into this night. So again, thank you very, very much. We really appreciate it. And I'll say good night, but our panelists uh, have agreed to just stay for a few minutes. Sometimes you have a one-on-one -on -one question you want, feel free to come up and, uh, and ask any questions that you have. And otherwise, we'll see you this fall at our fall program. Bye-bye. <laughs>